So we're now going to go ahead and look at 1.2. And 1.2 is our applications. And so we're going to be learning about applications today. And when we look at applications, we have to be very careful with our answers because our answers have to be labeled in the units that are correct for the question. So when we look at applications, we're going to first start off with units of measure. And when we label things, I always label them at the end. And we need to make sure that, that our label makes sense with what it goes with. So we're going to start with our base units. And our base units are going to be things like feet, yards, inches, miles, maybe kilometers, maybe meters. So the base units, these are all going to be things that we can measure. And what goes with the base units? Well, the base units go with length, width, height, perimeter, and distance. So these are all going with the base units. So if we can measure something, it goes with the base unit. If we can measure the height of something, it's going to be in the base unit. It might be in feet. It might be in, 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 in inches. It might be in meters. could be a distance. How far do we drive in the car? Well, that's going to be in miles or kilometers. So those are the base units. Then we have square units. Next. And square units, well, they're your units squared, so that's going to be things like square feet, square inches, square meters. Those are all your square units, and there's, there's more of them too. But what do square units go with? They go with either an area or surface area. So when we talk about our square units, they're going to go with either an area or a surface area. So if we ever see something that has a, a square unit attached to it, what does that come from? That came from an area, either a surface area or just an area, something like a rectangle, length times width. So those are your square units. Then we've got cubic units. And for cubic units, we have the cubic inches. You might have cubic centimeters. And you might have cubic meters. And of course, there's more of them. But those are just some of the basic cubic units. And what do they go with? They go with the volume. And so cubic in, units go with the volume. Now, think about the engine in your car. Okay, the engine in your car is either going to be measured in cubic centimeters, cubic cc's, or in cubic inches. Okay? And why is it is a cubic unit? Because that's how much it displaces. So the volume goes with cubic units. So whenever we see a cubic unit, it came from a volume. Now, what else can go with a volume? Well, liters or milliliters. Depending upon if it's a if it's a liquid that you're measuring for the volume, or if it's just seeing the displacement of an object. So it can either be cubic units for the volume, or it can be in either liters or milliliters. Then we also have the rate. Okay? And rate is is how fast you're going, and these are going to be in division. And so for the rate. The units are always going to be distance over a time. So that's how we measure our rate. So the most common one is miles per hour. Okay. Another common one is kilometers per hour. Okay. Miles per hour, 
kilometers per hour. We could also have meters per second. We could have feet per second, and so on. But whenever we talk about a rate, that's how fast you're going to drive a car, or maybe you're looking at how fast a bullet travels. And if you're looking at how fast a bullet travels, then that would be in feet per second or meters per second. Okay. If you're looking at a car, it's going to be in miles per hour or kilometers per hour. But when we talk about a rate of speed, that's always going to be a distance of some kind divided by a time. That's your rate. Now that we understand our units of measure, we're now going to look at some applications. And we're going to be looking at these from our textbook, and we're going to be reading them once through, and then we're going to look at it again, each piece to try to figure out how we can come up with an equation and solve it. So I'm going to be picking these from our textbook, and we're going to start off with a geometric problem. And we're going to be in, in 1.2 now. I'm going to give you the page number here. We're going to begin with question 15. So this is page 119, question 15. And I'm going to put it up on the, on the, on the projector here so you can see it as well. And we're going to read it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to then build our equation, we're going to solve it, and then make sure that we answer it correctly. And students always struggle with these, but we're going to spend some time, and I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible to understand. The perimeter of a triangular plot of land is 2,400 feet. The longest side is 200 feet less than twice the shortest side. The middle side is 200 feet less than the longest side. We want to find the lengths of the three sides of the triangular plot. So we read it, and there's a lot of information here, but we're going to look at each piece individually. First thing we encounter is perimeter. And what's the basic definition of a perimeter? Well, if I look at the perimeter of any type of, of object, doesn't matter what it is, the perimeter is always the same, and the perimeter is always the sum of all the sides. So we're going to write that down first. So whenever we see the perimeter, that means we sum up all the sides. And in this case, they gave us our perimeter to be 2,400 feet. So whenever I look at these, I always read the question through once, and then I take a moment to think about what I've got, and then I go back and I start analyzing it piece by piece. So perimeter, the basic definition of that, is you just sum up all the sides. And so that's 2,400 feet, so we know that. Now we're looking at a triangle, and how many sides are in a triangle? Three, okay? And it's not equilateral, it's not isosceles, it just says it's a triangle. And for this triangle, we have the three sides, and so they're all different. So we've got a short side, a middle side, and we've got the longest side. Now, I like to write it up in terms of words, and then translate it into a variable. I think you're less likely to make a mistake when you look at them in that way. So we've got a perimeter, and we've got the three sides. Now let's see how they relate to each other. The longest side is 200 feet less than twice the shortest. So that means the longest side is going to be two times the short side. Minus 200. Everyone okay with how I got that, right? Because it says the longest side is twice the shortest side minus 200. What do we know next? Let's see the next piece. The next piece says the middle side is 200 feet less 
than the longest side. So the longest, uh, the middle side is going to be the long side minus 200. Now one of these we know nothing about, and it told us nothing at all about the short side. So what do we know about the short side? We know nothing about it, so we're going to use an x to represent the short side. Is everyone kind of okay with how I did that? So I read the question through, I take my time and I try to write down the pieces and everything that goes with it. Now we translate this all to the variable x. So the short side is already done. The short side is x, and that's done. We're going to come back to the middle side in a moment, but what about the longest side? Okay, the longest side is going to be twice the shortest side, minus 200. And we said that the short side was x, so the longest side is going to be 2x minus 200. Okay. Now what about the middle side? How does the middle side work? Well, it's going to require a little bit of algebra because the middle side is the longest side, which is 2x minus 200 minus another 200, right? Because that's here. We still have to subtract off that other 200. So what does it come out to be now? It comes out to be 2x minus what? 400. So these are our three pieces. We've got x, we've got 2x minus 400, and we've got 2x minus 200. And by the way, this came from page 119. So in case you need to write that down or want to write that down, that's on page 119. Now, what do we know from here? You've got everything labeled in terms of x. Now we need to build our equation. What do we know? We know the perimeter is the sum of all the sides. So let's work with that. So our perimeter is going to be the short side plus the middle plus the longest side. And we'll plug in the value of that perimeter in a moment. But I always like to do things in smaller pieces. So we know the short side, well, we found that to be x. And we know the middle side, well, that is 2x minus 400. And then we've got the longest side, which is 2x minus what? 200 there. All right, so there's the middle side here. And then we've got the longest side. And now we're going to put everything together. And so how many x's do we have total when we add across? It looks like we've got 5x. And then what about the numbers? It looks like it's going to be minus what? 600. And that is our perimeter in terms of the variable x. Now, what else do we know? We have a value for the perimeter, don't we? And so now we can rewrite this because we know that our perimeter is 2,400. So our perimeter was that 5x minus 600, and we know that that is going to be now 2,400. So that's going to go there. <coughs> And now we can finish this out. So we're going to add the 600 over. And 5x equals now the 3,000. Divide by our 5. And that leaves me with x equaling 600. Right? However, that's not going to be our final answer, is it? No. Because whenever we work in an application, we've got to make sure that what we get is the answer that they want. And we don't put the units on until the very end. When we get to the end, we put the units on. I don't put them on early because then it would be too much. So I put them on at the end. So we got the 600. Now what does that 600 actually go with? Well, let's go back up and look. Yeah, the 600, well that goes with the short side. 
So we need to get all three of them. So let's now try to use this to get all three of them. So we've got x is 600, and that is the short side. So the short side is x, and that's going to be 600. Now, what's the units here? Well, when we read this, it says the perimeter is 2,400 feet. Okay, so that tells me then, when I find these links, what are they going to be in? Feet as well. So make sure all the units are the same. So that's going to be six feet for the short one. Then we have the middle, which is 2x minus 400, which is 2 times that 600 minus 400. And that leaves me with 800 feet there. And then what about the longest side? Well, the longest is 2x minus 200. And so what does that come out to give you now? That comes out to be 1,000 feet. And does that answer the question? Yep. How do I know? What do we want from this question? We want to get all three links. We have all three of them. Yes. Are they labeled? Yes. Now, how can you quickly check to make sure it makes sense? Yep. Add them all up. And what should they add up to give you? They should add up to give you 2,400. Do they do that? Yes, they do. So we know that we did it correctly. Then. So you're going to have a couple of geometric figure type of questions like that. Now, also, if you ever need to, you're going to find in the back of your textbook all the formulas that you might need. So you might need the area formula, the perimeter formula. They're all here. I just remember, though, that the perimeter is adding up all the sides. So that's, that's a geometric figure type of question. Next, we're going to look at distance problems. And when we talk about distance questions and problems, we have to make sure that we're careful about the direction. So we use vectors to represent the directions. This is going to be the distance problems. Now there are three different outcomes for a distance problem. They can either add together so if your vectors go in opposite directions like this, they add together. These add together. If they go towards each other like this, they add together. So one outcome is they add. And that's the most common one. They can also subtract from each other. And they subtract from each other when they overlap. So two people running a race. This is going to be subtraction because they overlap. Anytime they overlap, they subtract from each other. So the part we're looking for is the overlap. See, these overlap each other, so they subtract. And they can also equal each other. And how would they equal each other? Well, they can equal each other when you look at a distance that's the same. And that might be something like going to work and coming back home. The distances should be the same. So here's our three different outcomes. They can add together, they can subtract from each other, or they can equal each other. That's the three. How do we figure out what we've got? We draw vectors. These are called vectors, and they just give us the direction. So whenever we look at these type of questions, the first thing we do is we identify is it addition, subtraction, or equaling each other. And so we're going to do two of these distance questions.
And we're going to start with question 19. So I'll put this up on the overhead. We're going to talk about question 19. And then we're going to solve it. Now, don't, do not worry about the tables. I don't like to use the tables. I think the tables are more confusing than not using them. So I don't use the tables at all. I like to draw diagrams and talk about what we've got. So don't worry about the table. I'm not going to make a table. We're just going to draw a diagram to get the equation. So we're going to read it. And we're on question 19. So Margaret drove to a business appointment at 50 miles an hour. Her average speed on the return trip was 40 miles an hour. Okay, And the return trip took a quarter of an hour longer because of heavy traffic. How far did she travel to the appointment? So let's see what we've got. We've got Margaret, and she's going to drive to her business appointment, and then she's going to come back. So what does that look like? Okay, it looks like she's, she's going to her business appointment in the morning. And then she's coming back in the afternoon. So the way I've got these diagrams drawn here, what would this be? This would be equal, right? Because they should be the same. If it's 10 miles to the business appointment, it should be 10 miles to come back home. They should be equal, right? Because they, they're on top of each other and they're the same. Now, when we talk about the distance, there are three things that are involved in any of these distance problems. And think about driving a car. When you drive a car, there's three things that go together to make that work. How long were you in the car for? So we have a time. How fast were you going in either miles or kilometers? So that's your rate of speed. And then how far did you drive? How many miles or how many kilometers did you, did you travel? So rate, time, and distance. Now, what we normally have to find is the distance. You're usually given the rate and the time, and they multiply together to give you the distance. So in the morning, let's see what we've got here. In the morning, she's traveling at 50 miles an hour. And then she comes back in the afternoon. And what do we know about the afternoon? What's the rate of speed in the afternoon? 40. Okay, so that's going to go here. Now we talk about our times. Do we know what the time in the morning is? Is that given to us at all? No. So that's going to be our variable x. So I'm going to put the x there. Now what about the afternoon? Okay. It takes them longer, right? Why is it going to take longer? Because she's traveling slower. And how much longer? A quarter of an hour. So that's going to now be x plus one-fourth there. Now we can use this information to build our equation and solve it. How do we find our distance? Well, distance is the rate of speed times the time that you travel. Rate times time as the distance. And we know these are going to be the same. So we know the morning is going to equal the afternoon. Now, how do we find these distances? Well, we multiply them together. So here's our pattern. And this is going to work for the distance problems, the mixture problems, and the investment problems later today. So when we look at the morning, we look at our distance, and these go together. Rate times time gives you the distance. So that's going to be 50 times x, so that is 
50 exit, right? What about in the afternoon? Yep, we've got 40 times x plus 1 fourth. And now we're going to go ahead and distribute that 40 through. If you struggle with fractions, you can just write them over to the side. So we've got 50x here. Distributing that, that 40 through, we've got 40x. Now what about 40 over 1? Yep, times 1 fourth. Those can cancel, and you're correct. That's going to now give you 10. And if you struggle with fractions, just write it over the side and work it out. Write your whole number over 1, and then just multiply and reduce, or you cross-cancel here. Now we can finish it, and we're going to move that 40x over, and that leaves us then with 10x equals 10, we'll divide by our 10, and that leaves us now with x equaling 1. But x equaling 1, that is not going to be our solution, because we have to make sure that we go back and we answer that question. And let's talk about what x is. And I'm going to go ahead, by the way, and pass out the sign-in sheet. Just make sure you sign the sign-in sheet. What is x? What does x represent? We found it, but what is it? What is it? It's a time. Okay, so x represents time. So this is the time. Now, we don't want the time. Because in the question, what does it say? How far did she travel? Right. So we want the distance. So that's what we're going to have to find. Now let's go back and look at the morning. In the morning, we've got a rate of speed of 50. And we've got a time x. But we know that x is 1, don't we? So now we can use this to find the distance, which is going to be our answer. So our distance is going to be that rate of speed, which is 50, times that 1 hour. And that gives us then 50. And that's going to be in terms of miles, right? Not miles per hour, because it's, it's miles that we're looking at, because it's a distance. That's our, our unit of measure for that, our base unit. And so our answer would be 50 miles, okay? Not one, because one is the time. So it only took them one hour in the morning, but she drove 50 miles. And we want to make sure that we answer the question. A lot of times students don't go back and reread the question again. They get an, a value for x and they think that's the answer. And that may or may not be the finished answer. In that question, they were equal. Now we're going to look at one where they add together. And we're going to look at question 22. Page 120, question 22. Do what now? Yeah, yeah, because, okay, how do we know we finished it? Let's go back and reread it. Let's make sure. Yep, it says, we read this, but what's it say in that last part here? It said, how far did she travel to the appointment. And we found that, didn't we? Right? And that was 50 miles. So she traveled 50 miles to that appointment. And that answered the question, so we know we're done. Okay? What about question 22? This is an airplane question. And we're looking at, at two airplanes. And the last one was equaling. This one's going to be addition. So let's look at, at 22 here. 
So, so we've got two airplanes that are going to leave LA at the same time. One travels south to San Diego, and the other one travels north to San Francisco. And the San Diego plane flies 50 miles per hour slower than the San Francisco plane. And in a half hour, the planes are 275 miles apart. And we want to find their speed. So the first thing I notice is this is a distance question. And I always start by drawing out my vectors, the arrows. And so we've got two airplanes, and they're going to start here in L.A. One's going north, and one's going south. And so we've got these two airplanes. One is traveling to San Diego, and one heads north to San Francisco. So what type of problem is this going to be? Addition, subtraction, or equal? Okay, it's going to be addition, and how do I know that? Because they're going in opposite directions, right? And there's no overlapping. If they overlap, it's subtraction. Each of these, again, has a rate and a time. So let's see what we've got for each of these. One heads south, one heads north. We did all of that. The San Diego plane flies 50 miles per hour slower than the San Francisco plane. So do we know the speed of the San Francisco plane? No, because that's going to be our unknown. Right? We don't know the speed of the San Francisco plane. So what do we know about the speed of the San Diego plane? It flies slower, so it's going to be what now? It's going to be yep, x minus 50. And we do know the times. We know they start at the same time, and they are in the air for a half hour. So that means each of these times is going to be what? One half. Okay. So this is what we've got, and we're going to now use this to build our equation. And we also have one more part that we haven't talked about yet, but that's our total distance. And the total distance apart is going to be what? How far apart are these going to be? 275. Okay, so we'll use this here in a moment. So they're 275 miles apart, and we've got everything diagrammed out. So now we can move on. We can move on and build our equation. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And these are adding. So we know we have the San Francisco plane. And that's going to be added to the San Diego plane. And that's going to equal that total distance. And how do we find our distance? Well, again, the distance is the rate times the time. And we use those to then build our equation. So let's look at our San Francisco plane. What was it? Rate of speed is x, time is 1 half. So putting those together, that's going to be my 1 half x, isn't it? That's for the San Francisco plane. Now what about the San Diego plane? Uh, time is 1 half, and what's my rate? x minus 50. And then what is it going to equal? 275 on the right hand side. 
So now we've got it. Now we distribute that one half through. So we've got one half x plus distributing through one half x. And then what's half of 50? Okay, half of 50 is 25. That equals my 275. And what do we know about a half and another half? It's going to make it a whole x. And we're going to go ahead and add that 25 over. And that's going to give you now x equaling, when we do that, 300. how I did that. And if I'm going too fast, just be sure and say something. When you're confused about something, just make sure and say something. So that's the 300. Now that's only part of the answer because when we go back and we look at it again, it says in this particular question, what are their speeds? So we need to make sure that we get both speeds. Now the San Francisco plane was X. So we're going to look now at the San Francisco plane. And its rate of speed was x, which is then 300, right? Okay, I'll move this up so we can see here. Sorry about that. And that's going to be 300, and that's miles per hour. So the San Francisco plane is 300 miles an hour. We also need to find the San Diego plane. And what's the San Diego plane going to be? Okay, it's less than, and it's x minus 50. And that's going to then be 250. And that is now going to be also in terms of miles per hour. So there's our, our two speeds, 300 and 250. And that answers the question. So we did answer it. We got what we wanted. Everything has been labeled. Okay, so now we can move on to the next one. We have done addition. And we've done the equals. Now we're going to look at a subtraction question. And the subtraction question is when they overlap. So question 23, it's actually very easy. It's actually easier than the last two. But question 23 is a subtraction question. And these overlap. So we've got two runners running a race. So in, in the Apple Hill Fun Run, Mary runs at 7 miles an hour. And Janet runs at 5. If they start at the same time, how long will it be before they are a mile and a half apart, or 1.5 miles apart? So let's draw our picture. And they've, they've got one drawn here too, but we're going to redraw it. And always write the faster runner first. So Mary's running fastest. And our picture looks like this. Here's Mary, and here's Janet. And this is going to be subtraction, isn't it? Right? And why is it subtraction? Because they overlap. That's how I remember, is they overlap each other. So this is subtraction. Okay, and let's find each of their rates. So Mary runs at 7. <coughs> Janet runs at 5 and Mary's time do we know Mary's time? nope do we know Janet's time? nope but we do know they're the same because they start at the same time and they're both unknown what else do we know? that we haven't talked about yet. The last part says they're going to be at 1.5 miles apart. So that's going to be my distance apart. Okay. 
Now we can build our equation. We're going to look at our distance. And the distance, again, is the rate times the time. That's going to be our distance apart. And let's look at each one of these. And in this case, we're going to be subtracting, right? So make sure you remember that. We're going to be subtracting. And what do we know about Mary? Rate times time. And this is an easier question, I think, than the last one. Rate times time would simply be a 7x. Janet, 5x. And it's going to equal the distance apart. And what is that distance apart? 1.5. So simply kind of understanding where I'm getting these pieces from. Okay. You draw a diagram, and what are our choices? It can be either adding together, equaling, or it can be subtracting. And we always look at our distance because the distance is the rate times the time. Now we can quickly finish this. So that gives you a 2x equals now 1.5. We'll divide by our 2. And that gives you x equaling now 0 0.75. And what is this? This is the time. Now, what does the question specifically want you to find? If we read that last part there, it says, how long will it be? So we're looking for the time. And we found the time, so let's go ahead and label that. So what would our answer be? 0 0.75 hours. Or you could write that as 45 minutes, either one. I would take either one. Both are okay. So you can either write that as 0 0.75 hours, or you can write that again as 45 minutes. That answers the question, and so now we can move on to the next one. Right? So always make sure what you get actually finishes the question out. Next, we're going to be looking at mixture problems. And we're going to be mixing chemicals together. Now, when we mix chemicals together, there's two things that we need to know. We need to know the concentration of the chemical. So what percentage rate is it? And we need to know how much of it do we have. How many liters, or how many gallons, or how many milliliters. We're going to multiply those together, just like we did with the distance, but it's going to give you the pure. So we need a percentage rate, and we need an amount. And those multiply together to give you a pure. Now, unlike the distance ones, these always add together. And I always draw a picture with, with boxes when I work these out. And we're going to look now at question number. We'll start with question 31. And this, I think, is an easier one. And then we'll go back and we'll get question 30. Well, we're going to start with 31 because I think it's a little bit easy. We're going to draw a diagram with these boxes and then we're going to solve an answer to question. So Aaron wishes to strengthen the mixture from 10% to 30%. How much pure alcohol should be added to 7 liters of that 10% solution. Now what we need to be careful of is we need to be careful and make sure that we know what percentage goes in what box. I like to draw these boxes and I like to label them 1, 2, and 3 because it helps me remember that 1 plus 2 equals 3. And box number 1 is going to be what we're going to start with. And box number three is what we want to end with. Okay. 
each of these is going to have an amount and it's going to have a percentage rate. So we need an amount and we need a percentage rate. And I think of it as 1 plus 2 is 3. That makes it easier for me to remember these amounts are going to add across. Now, what we have to be careful of is what percentage goes where. So Aaron wishes to strengthen the mixture from 10% to 30%. So we are going to start with a 10% solution here. That's what we start with. What do we want to end up with? What percentage? Can someone tell me? We want to end up with that 30, don't we? Right? That's what we want. Because it says we want to strengthen the mixture from 10% to 30%. So over here in box 3, we're going to put the 30%. And how do we strengthen that up? We use pure. So we're going to add in that pure alcohol. And what is the concentration of that pure alcohol? Anything that's pure is going to be 100%. So whenever you use pure, it's 100%. Unless it's water. Water would be zero. Now we need to fill in the amounts. So I usually do the, in, the, the percentage rates first, and then the amounts after that. So let's see what we've got here. It says how much pure alcohol should be added to 7 liters of the 10% mixture. So we know we have 7 liters of the 10%. So that means the 7 is going to go there. But do we know anything at all about the pure? No. So that's going to be our variable x. So that's going to go here. And then what are these going to do? Well, they're going to add across because 1 plus 2 is 3. So those go together, and that gives you x plus 7 there. Or 7 plus x. Either way, they're the same. Now we can use this to fill our equation and finish this question. So now we can use this to build our equation. And how we build our equations is based on the pure. Right? So pure is the amount times the rate. And let's start with box number one. These multiply together. Now with these percentages, we've got to make sure we turn them into a decimal. So we have box number one, seven, and we're going to multiply that by 10%, so that's 0 0.1. We've got box number two. 100% is one times x. And the reason why I'm writing it like this is just so you can see that that 100% makes it the one there. And then what does it equal for box number three? Well, that's 0 0.3 times 7 plus x there. Okay. Now we've got what we need, and we can finish it. So distribute through and multiply. So 7 times 0 0.1, multiplying out, that's going to be 0 0.7. 1 times x is just simply an x. Distributing through here, 0 0.3 times 7. Okay, that's going to be a 2.1. And then plus 0 0.3x. Okay, now we're going to finish this out by moving everything around. When I work with decimals, I'm going to put the 1 there just so we don't make a mistake with that x. So I'm going to put the 1 there because we have these decimals. So I'm going to move over that 0.3x. And I'm going to move over that 0.7 as well. Be careful with the decimals. A lot of times I see students make mistakes with the decimals. It's the easiest part. 
but it's where a lot of mistakes happen. So 1 minus 0 0.3. Well, that comes out to be a 0 0.7x thing. The other side, we've got 2.1 minus 0 0.7. Well, that comes out to be a 1.4, doesn't it? Now we divide. And what does that give you now for your answer? That gives you x equals 2, doesn't it? What does that x represent? We have to make sure we know what that x is. So let's go back up and look. What does x go with? Look at your picture here. x goes with the period, doesn't it? That's what we want to find because it says how much pure. So pure is going with the x, so let's write up our answer. So what would our answer be? Our answer would be 2, and our units in this case on question 31 are in terms of liters, so 2 liters at 100%. That is going to be our answer for this question. That's what they wanted, and I always like to label the percentage. So that answered that question. Let's look at another one of these. We're going to do two of these mixture questions, and then we'll do an investment question. The textbook, usually the questions go harder as they go in order, but sometimes they're not. And question 30, I think, is actually a more difficult question than 31 because they're different chemicals. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at question 30. Now again, do not worry about that table. I think the table is more confusing than just jumping to the equation. So when you look at question 30, don't even worry about the table. So don't even worry about it. We don't need it. But let's go ahead and read our question. So question 30, a student needs 10% hydrochloric acid solution for a chemistry experiment. How much of the 5% should she mix with 60 milliliters of the 20% to get the 10%? Where we have to make sure that we're careful is when we put these percentages down. Because we need to make sure we know what box gets what percentage. This is what we start with over here. And this is what we want to end up with. One, again, two, and one plus two equals three. That's how I remember that they add across. And each of these has an amount and also a percentage rate. A student needs a 10% solution. So when we talk about we need that 10%, that is what we want to end up with at the end, right? So that 10% is going to go in box what? One, two, or three. Three, right? Because that's what we want to end up with. But a lot of times students put it in the wrong place. But 10% is what we need. So we need to end up with a 10% solution. So 10% is going to go in box three. Now, what do we have to get that 10%? We've got a 5%, and we're going to mix that 5% then with a 20%. Now that we have the percentages, we can now deal with the amounts. And when we read this, it says we have 60 milliliters of a 20% solution. So that 60 is going to go there. And do we know the 5% amount? Is that given to us at all? No. So that's going to be our unknown. That's going to be our variable x. And remember, 1 plus 2 is 3. So these add together, and that gives you x plus 60. But that's the way I remember. It's 1 plus 2 is 3. 
I think it makes it easy to, to keep track of things. Now once we have our diagram, we can now work with our pure. And our pure is the amount times the rate. One, two, and three. And these add together. So let's now try to build our equation. Be very careful with these decimals. One of the most common mistakes is students will make a mistake when they use these percentages and hit the wrong decimal. So when we look at 5%, that's 0.05x, right? So make sure that you put that extra zero. So it's 0.05%, not 0.5, it's 0.05. What about the next one? It's 60 times 0 0.2, because right? that goes there. And then the last one is 0 0.1 times x plus 60. Go ahead and distribute through. We'll quickly distribute through here. So that is now 0.05x. And let's see, 60 times 0.2, that should be a 12, I believe. I always like to double check things. Everybody makes mistakes. But 60 times 0.2, yep, is 12. And it is. And then we'll distribute through. That's 0.1x. And distributing through here, that's 6. Be careful again with these decimals. Move that 0.1x over and move the 12 over. And again, be very, very careful with the decimals when you subtract these. We've got a 0 0.05 minus 0 0.1. The 0 0.1 is negative, it's the larger number. When we subtract them, we get a minus 0.05x. The 12s are going to cancel. The 0.1s, well, they cancel. And 6 minus 12 is a minus 6. Now we'll divide by a minus 0.05. And what happens when we take a negative and we divide it by another negative? Well, we get a positive, And that should come out to be, what, 120? Yep, 120. So that's going to come out to be 120. We need to make sure that we label it correctly. The 120, what does it go with? It goes with the 5%. And it's not in liters in this case, it's in milliliters. So what's our answer going to be now? Our answer is going to be 120 milliliters at that 5%. And that is what we wanted to find. We needed to find the 5% amount. And we did that. And there's our final finished answer. That answered the question. And we labeled it like what needed to be labeled. Now let's try another one. This one's going to be a, an investment problem. Now the investment problems and the mixture problems are almost the same. They're just a little bit different. We're going to look at question 36. Okay, so question 36 here. Again, we don't need that table. I think the tables are just confusing. And that's why we're not even going to look at the table. So we're not going to look at the table. We don't even need it. I think it just makes it harder. So we're looking at, at selling some land. So Roger bought two plots of land for a total of $120,000. When he sold the first plot, he made a profit of 15%. When he sold his second, he lost 10%. His total profit was $5,500.
How much did he pay for each piece of land? Instead of using boxes, I am going to use dollar signs to represent those investments. And this was question 36. This over here is going to be our total amount. Let's take a moment to talk about a savings account. So if I have a savings account in the bank and I get my statement in the mail, that statement is going to have three major things on it. That statement is going to have how much money I have in that account. So in a value of the account, so there's going to be an amount of money. There's going to be what percentage it pays out. That's your interest rate. And there's going to be how much I accumulated in money. That's your interest. So for example, if I had $10,000 in the bank, let's say it paid out a 1%, so I would get $100. Okay, that's, a, that's, that's the three parts. The amount would be the $10,000, the rate would be the, the 1%, and the interest would be the $100. Those are the three things, amount, rate, and interest. Now the interest is found the same way that we found the distance and the pure from the other questions. So we're going to multiply the rate times the amount to get the interest. So when we look at this question, we need to make sure we put everything in the correct place. There's a difference between the amount of money and the interest, right? Thousand or a hundred dollars versus ten thousand dollars. Big difference there. So let's look and see what we've got in this question. So Roger's got two plots of land, and he sold these two plots of land for a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So my total amount here is a hundred and twenty thousand, and that's going to go here, not the interest, the amount. And each of these is then going to have an amount and a percentage rate. And so we've got these two, these two accounts here, or two, two different types of, of investments. And it says, one, he made a profit of 15%. So that's going to be here, 15%. And the other one, he lost, what, 10%, I believe? Lost 10%. So I'm going to represent that with a minus. Here's the question. Do I know how much is in either one of these accounts? No, I have no idea. Now they're different, so X can't be used in both of them. So what I do is I'm going to call the first account unknown amount value of X. We don't know, so we're going to use an X here. Now, for the second one, we don't know it either, but it's always going to be the total minus x. And what was our total amount here? 120. So the second one will be 120 minus x. Why is it 120,000 minus x? Well, we need to make sure that the sides are the same. And if I add these across, right, what happens to the x's here? One's positive and one is negative. They cancel, and you get 120,000 equals 120,000. So it's always the first one is unknown, x. The second one is going to be the total minus x. So that's the important takeaway there. Now we can build our equation and solve this problem. And we're going to look now at the interest. And the interest is the amount times the rate. Okay, so let's go ahead and build this up. And our first one, what is it? 15%, so that's 0.15x. Our second one. In this case, it's a minus, right? So we have a 0 
So 0.1 and it's negative. Why is it negative in this case? Because we lost money. Normally it's positive, but this one's negative because we lost money. And what am I going to multiply that by? 120,000 minus X. And then what does it give me over here? This is my total interest, not the amount. How much money did I make at the end? When I sold these, how much money did I walk away with? Yep, I did not walk away with $120,000, did I? I walked away with $5,500. So that is why that is going in the interest. The interest is how much money we earned. When I walked away, I walked away with $5,500. Now we can finish it by distributing through. And always be careful about double negatives. And this is negative, so I'll go ahead and circle it so we know that it's negative there. And so we have a 0.15x. When we multiply through that negative 0.1, that's going to be what? Uh, negative 12,000, I think, isn't it? Yep, 120,000. That's going to be a minus 12,000. Double negative makes that a positive 0.1x, and that equals now my 5,500. And we're going to go ahead and combine the x's together. So that is now 0.25x, and we're going to add that 12,000 over. And we'll add those over. And that's going to be now uh, 17,500, isn't it? Because 12,000 plus 5,500, that gives me yep, 17,500, isn't it? So there's that piece. And now how do we finish it? Divide by the 0 0.25. And what does that give me for my answer for the value of x? That gives me now 70,000. Okay, that may or may not be our answer. That's part of it, I think, in this case. Because what does it want? In this case, it says, how much did you pay for each piece of land? So when we go back and look, one of them is X, right? And that's 15%. The other one is 120,000 minus X, and that was at a loss of 10%. So our first one is $70,000 at 15%, and the other one is 120,000 minus X, so that's 120,000 yep, minus 70,000, and that gives you now 50,000 at a loss of 10%, so minus 10%. We've got a few minutes left. I'm going to look at one of your homework questions, and I'm going to set it up. I'm not going to finish it, but I'm going to set up one of these investment questions for you. I'm going to set up question 8. So from your homework now, I'm not going to work it out completely, but I am going to help you set up question 8 because there's three of these. Okay, six, seven, and eight are all of these investment questions. So I'm going to work through question eight. I'm going to set it up. You're going to have to finish it though. And we've got enough time to set it up. And then we'll look at one like nine and ten after that. So question eight. Roberto invested some money at 2.75%. And then invested 4000 more than twice this amount at 3%. His annual income from the two investments was $1,257.50.
how much was invested at the 3%. So this is going to be your homework question number 8. I am not going to finish it completely. I am going to work it out partly for you. I'm going to set up the table and get you to the equation. But this is your question 8. So homework question 8 here. This is an investment problem. So let's look here and see what we've got. It says Roberto invested some money at 2.75%. So do we know how much money went in the 2.75%? No. 2.75% so here. Unknown amount of money, X. We don't know. Then he went and invested some more money at 3%. So we'll put the 3% here. And how much did he invest there? If we read it, it says... He invested 4000 more than twice this amount. So that will be 4000 plus 2x. And I'm going to go ahead and add these across. We don't need to, but I'm going to anyways. Add these across, and that gives you the 3x plus 4000. Now we can look at the interest. And interest is the amount times the rate. Okay, let's look at our first one. And our first one, now be careful with the decimals. A lot of times students make mistakes with these decimals. 2.75%, well that's 0 0.0275, and we're going to have to multiply that by x. The next one is 0 0.03, and that's going to be times 4,000 minus that 2, or sorry, plus that 2x. And what is that going to give you out? This is the total interest. And it's how much money we made. And how much money did we make? We made $1,257.00. And you can finish it from here. I'm not going to finish it for you, but you can finish it from here. We're going to look at one more question, and it's a real quick question. We're going to look at question 10, also from your homework. Because 9 and 10 are very similar. I'm going to work out 10, and you can use that to finish 9. But you can finish this one out on your own. You got the equation. Now, when you work it out, make sure you get the correct answer. I'm going to give you a hint. On this question 8, X is not the finished answer. All right? Because we want the 3%. X is going with the 2.75%. So that is not going to be your answer. You're going to have to take it and plug it back in here. So when you finish it, you have to go back, read it, and make sure that you get the actual answer that is needed. Question 10 is going to be the last question. And make sure that the sign-in sheet, make sure you sign that sign-in sheet if you haven't done so, so make sure that's floating around somewhere. But let's look at question 10. Okay, 9 and 10 are very, very similar. And they're easy questions. All you have to do is plug the number in. So we've got a linear model, and it says your home state uses this linear model to predict the number of vacationers Y compared to the, the average temperature of that week X. Find the number of vacationers predicted 
for a week with an average of 85 degrees temperature. Now we need to make sure we know where that 85 goes. And we're going to write up our equation first. Y equals 24 times X minus 70 plus 1274. X is the temperature. So X is the temperature. Now what we want is we want it to be 85 degrees. So we want 85 degrees. So what are we going to use then for X? We're going to use 85. And when we plug that 85 in, that's going to tell us how many vacationers we would expect during that week. So you don't have to do much else. You plug it in, calculate it out, and you get your answer. Nine is almost exactly the same. It's just it's doing the sales of a toy. This one's doing temperature and vacation. So we're going to plug that in. So that's 24 times 85 minus 70 plus 1274. We we'll put those together, and that's 24 times 15 plus that 1274. And we're going to multiply and put those together. And that gives me 1,634. And what is that? Okay, that's Y, right? And what is Y? Y is the number of vacationers. So 1,634 vacationers. So that would be your answer on that. Now, what's our homework? Just make sure we understand what our homework is. The homework, and it's all due on Tuesday. Homework is 1-1. One, one. You're going to have to finish that if you haven't done so. And 1.2. You should be able to finish that as well. So on Tuesday, make sure you have that homework finished. And I'll give you a new packet. So just finish that packet for Tuesday. And we can go over any questions that you might have out of 1.2 as well. So if there's some of these that you're struggling with, make sure you ask about them next class period. So we'll see everyone then on next Tuesday. Uh, please make sure and sign that sign-in sheet. So does somebody have the sign-in sheet? Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll have those notes and the video posted after class as well. So this afternoon I'll work on putting that together. Yep, you're welcome. Hey, you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It's, it won't be an excuse absence because my family are going to Arkansas. So well, hey, like, hey, no problem. So thanks for letting me know. Yeah. Um, I'll post. You'll, let's see, you'll be on Tuesday, so you'll have a new homework packet, and you can watch the video sometime too. Okay. okay? Thank you. Well, hey, you have a great trip. Yes.